Hi, this is the weather app we'll be building. We're going to take a beautiful UI design from Figma and turn it into a real iOS app. We're going to incorporate cool animations such as the scroll parallax and the text transitions on the drag gesture. We'll animate the cards with a scroll effect together with the slide over when switching between the tabs of the segmented control. There will be lots of custom components involved and those are what makes an app stand out. That's why we're going to custom build all these tab bar, navigation bar, search bar, this bottom sheet with a stunning layer of background blur. I'll show you how to implement all of that from scratch in Swift UI, and I will guide you through every step of the way. This course is beginner friendly and is made for you if you want to improve your UI and animation craft. Besides, I'm confident you will pick up neat techniques along the way. I am Dara, and I want to thank Rive for sponsoring this video. Rive is a design and animation tool that lets you create interactive assets. Level up your design by integrating rich animations to any platform, whether it's a website, app, or game. Thanks to its state machine, you define the interactions and states that trigger the flows of animations. What's helpful is that there's a large library of free animated assets made by the community, which you can inspect, use as is, or edit them to personalize for your own project. Try it out for free by creating an account. I will be providing the project's design in Figma as part of the downloadable source files. So you can inspect the colors, typography, assets that you can find in components, and animations. You may also search for it in the Figma community. Search for weather. It's this one and duplicate it from here. That's what I did. All the UI and animations were designed by Axe and Vadi from the ground up. If you want to check the animations, you would have to run the prototype. Select the home screen and click on the play button. Wait for it to load. Then you will be able to see how the animations and interactions are performing. For example, if I select a different tab, drag the bottom sheet up and back down, go to the next screen, scrolling the widgets up, I can see the background layer underneath the navigation bar and back to the home screen. Notice that all of the animations I showed you before are similar to the prototype here. Okay, let's discuss about the requirement. To follow this course, you will need Xcode. Xcode is a tool for building iOS applications. If you haven't already, you need to download Xcode in the Mac App Store. Make sure its version is minimum 13 because we'll be deploying the app on iOS 15. Now that you've got Xcode up and running, let's create the new project. Choose the iOS app template. Next. Name the product Weather. The organization identifier is your domain in reverse. Make sure the interface is Swift UI and the language Swift. Next. Create. Okay, we're going to close the right panel, resume, and it's a good idea to change the simulator device to the latest iOS device. In this case, is iPhone 13. I'm also going to reduce the preview size. Voila. All right. A comprehensive app has custom colors, icons, illustrations, images, and so on. I have prepared assets for you for this project so you can skip the tedious step of importing them from Figma and setting up the color sets in Xcode. They are included with the source files and can be downloaded at the bottom of this course page. You will find the assets folders where there are colors, icons, and images. 
the resources for additional code and the Xcode projects for every section of this course. To import assets, go back to Xcode and open the assets folder. And then we're going to drag and drop the subfolders from the assets folders inside Xcode. There you go. Now you can see all the colors, icons, and images already included in your project. I'm going to show you though how to add a color set as an example. Right click on the folder colors, new color set. We're going to open the inspector panel and you can change the name of the color. Select appearances none since we only have the colors in dark mode. Then click on the color card to change its attributes. Make sure the content is sRGB and select 8-bit hexadecimal as the input method. Copy the hex color from the design system. Let's go to Figma. This one. And paste here. And that's how you do it. We can delete it now. Right click on color and delete selected items. Also close the attributes inspector. Next, it is important to well organize your files in any project. We're going to set up the folder structure for ours. First, we're going to create the main folders. Right click on the weather app, new group. This folder is for views. And repeat for models and utils. Move them below. Then under the folder views, we're going to create subfolders. Right click, new group, main. Navigation. Detail. And lastly, components. I'm going to reorder again. That's it. After the folders have been set up, we can move the content view inside the main folder. There is one final preparation we need to do. Let's talk about color extension. In the design, there are a lot of gradient colors. For example, the bottom sheet, the background color, the search bar, the background card here. Even the lights are in gradient. What can I say? They add a nice kick compared to a monotone color. But in Swift UI, it's long to code them. I'd recommend to set up a helper method to speed up the process. In another course, I showed how to make an extension to linear gradient. This time, I'll go with the color extensions since the gradients are lined in different directions. The added benefits are that the colors are all referenced in one place and it auto completes for you. So under Utils, Create a new file. It's going to be a Swift file next. Call it extension for storing extension methods. Color is an instance of Swift UI, so we'll need to import it. Replace foundation by Swift UI. Then make an extension to color. And we'll declare static constant properties for each of the colors needed by using the color set names. By color set names, I mean these ones. So we're going to do the background color first. Static. Let. Background. Equal. Static property. 
lets any color instance access to it. Linear gradient. And then we're going to initialize linear gradient with gradient start point and end point. After that, initialize gradient again, now with colors. And it's going to be an array of color. So start with the square bracket. The first color is color by the name of background one. And the second color is background two. Then the start point is top leading, the end point, bottom, trailing. And that's how you set up a linear gradient. It's long, isn't it? So what I'm going to do, I showed you one. For the rest of the colors, I will copy paste. Now you may write them up from scratch by checking the design, or you could just open the source files and drag and drop the extension files to your project, like how Apple does it with the tutorials. With the preparation work out of the way, we can proceed with implementing the views. We can close these tabs. Usually in a Swift UI app, the child view put inside of content view is the starting view when the app launches because content view is referenced in the app file. So instead of the text, replace this by home view that we're going to create right away. So right click on main, new file, Swift UI view this time. It's going to be home view. Let's tackle the home view. Resume the preview. And again. At a glance, it's obvious this screen has many layers stacked on top of each other. We have the background image, the house, the hero text, the bottom sheet. For this reason, we'll start off with a Z stack. The bottommost layer is a purplish gradient color. We can easily retrieve that from our color extension. Color dot background. See how easy that was? Let's reduce this. To eliminate the white space on top and at the bottom of the screen, which is the safe area reserved for the notch and the home indicator of the iPhone, instructed to ignore the safe area. So we're going to add a modifier, ignore safe area. Better. By the way, I like to add a marker for each UI element as a reference, like this. Two slashes for comment, mark in uppercase, colon, and this is the background color. This also lets you easily toggle between each marker here. Right above the background color is the night sky image. To display an image, initialize image with the name of the asset background. Usually it's a good idea to set the background image to resizable so that it adjusts to the size of the device or mode that is portrait or landscape. Also, we're going to make it fill up the whole screen. Ignore safe area. Then we'll stack the house on top of the background. Why is not below the text, you may ask? In the prototype, if I drag up the bottom sheet, the house gets underneath all the text. See? So image, house, 
The current position of the house center is in the middle of the screen. Now we could calculate that position versus where it should be and subtract by another, but that's going to be more complicated. So the shortcut is to align the image at the top using the frame modifier. And we're going to set the max height to infinity and alignment top. Then we're going to add a padding top of 257 because we know this number from the design. Two fifty seven. On top of it all, we'll display the current weather information as the hero of the home screen. These informations are stacked vertically, so we'll lay down a V stack. The top is a text view with the city info, Montreal. We're going to change the font to large title. How did I get this font size? I compared the font size from the design, which is 34 with Apple's typography to get the corresponding size. So 34 is equivalent to large title. Then we're going to add a spacer to push the stack to the top. Better. The rest of the info is grouped in another V stack. Ideally, there would be three upcoming text views, but first, let's look at the version of the home screen when the sheet is up in the components page to understand why we can't do that. You can see that the final temperature and weather text are combined together in one string. So we have no choice but to do the same here. Text 19. To write the degree symbol, press on Shift Option 8. Then plus, mostly clear. To force a line break between 19 degrees and mostly clear, we can add backslash and N. There you go. Then add another text view for the high and low temperatures. Actually, we're going to copy that from the design. Make the font title three and change the weight to semi bold. Finally, we're going to add a top padding of 51. To view the text colors in white in the preview, we can change it to dark mode. Preferred color scheme dot dark. Previously, we presented a multi-line text using a single string. In this section, we're going to learn how to concatenate text views and apply mixed styling to them in two different ways to arrive at this. There is a simpler method and a more intricate one. Both have their own pros and cons. Go with the simpler method if that works for you and switch to the attributed string for more granular styling. The easiest method is to split the concatenated string into three separate text views. Let's comment this out. Text, 19 degree. Text, backslash N. 
in text mostly clear. Then we can simply combine multiple text views together with the plus operator and style them differently with their own modifiers. Plus here and plus here. It's similar to before, but the plus signs are used outside of the text views. Let's style them. Font dot system with size 96 and weight thin. Foreground color primary. For mostly clear font title three weight semi bold. Let's also change the foreground color to secondary. We're going to add a space after the line break tag to shift the text here a little bit to the right. Somehow it got skewed. So add a space here. After we have set the temperature's font size to large, we're going to realize that the spacings before and after it do not match those of the design. Indeed, the line height in Swift UI is bigger than in Figma. After many attempts to match, I've settled on the spacing of minus 10. So we're going to add a spacing in the V stack here to minus 10. This only fixes the top spacing though. For the bottom spacing, since it's separated by a line break, I couldn't find a solution. In general, we could call it a day. However, when the mix styling involves more complicated attributes, especially animation, attributed string is the alternative method, as the name implies. Attributed string is new since iOS 15. This is particularly useful for formatting differently for numbers and dates, appending links, and integrating markdown. In our case, things start to fall apart when we try to add an opacity to the middle text view, for example. Let's try that. Opacity, let's say 0 0.5. And Xcode is going to brand you with the error cannot convert value of type sum view to expected argument type text. This means that opacity can only modify the view, not the text. It's undo. So we'll need to turn all this text into an attributed string. To do that, first we're going to create a private variable under the body. Private var attributed string of type attributed string. We'll define our string. by initializing attributed string with the same string as this one. And that's why I kept it. Now you can delete this line. Let's return it to shut down the error. Return string. Now comment out the three text views. And we're going to replace that with the new one and only one with the attributed string variable. Next, we'll extract different parts of this string. In this context, it's called range of characters. Let's start with the temperature. Let tem equal to string dot range of 19 degrees. If you option click on temp, it indicates that it's an optional with the question mark. And therefore we should turn that sentence into optional binding with the keyword if. Just before let, add the if keyword. And at the end of the line, 
insert curly braces. Now we can apply the attributes to this range using the same modifiers as before. So string of temp dot font is equal to system size with 96 weight thin and remove the design. Also string of the temp dot foreground color is equal to primary. Let's do the same for the weather. If let weather is equal to the string range of mostly clear curly braces string weather dot font scroll to title three dot weight semi bold and string weather dot foreground color scroll to secondary while we're here, add another range for the vertical bar or the pipe character. We'll definitely need it later. Here, if let pipe is equal to string dot range of this character, then copy and paste the styling from the weather. Let's replace weather with pipe. And now we can delete this commented out code. I forgot to add some spaces here and before and after the vertical bar. By converting our string this way, we'll be able to update its formats based on states that we'll integrate later on. Note that we have limited options in styling the attributed string. You can view them by command clicking on one of the attributes. Let's say font, jump to definition. These are the attributes that you can play with. Font, foreground color, background color, strike through style, underline style, current tracking, baseline offset, accessibility, and foundation. This app has a striking custom tab bar with a unique line and shape. In this section, we'll learn how to build a non-default tab bar. We're only going to implement the back portion of the tab bar though and skip the front part of it. Also, we'll enable the navigation to another screen, which is the weather screen, by clicking on the right button of the tab bar. Let's begin by creating a new file on the, the navigation folder. It's going to be a Swift UI view. Next, name it tab bar. Create. The tab bar will have an action property passed to it, and this action will be reserved for the left button. To add a property, type var action. And this is going to be a function that's going to return void. The preview is going to require you to pass in an action. So click on fix and type curly braces. This means there's no action. Resume. At the same time, make the preview a dark scheme. Preferred color scheme dark. The parent stack of the tab bar is going to be a Z stack. Let's put in a text view for the moment so we can see what's going on. Text. Let's say tab bar. As you know, a tab bar by default is found at the bottom of the screen. To push it down, set the frame of the Z stack. 
to max height infinity in alignment bottom another obvious point about it is that it should disregard the safe area so ignore safe area before continuing i want to introduce you to sf symbols sf symbols is a catalog of native icons provided by apple it was released at the same time as Swift UI and allows you to integrate icons seamlessly to your iOS applications without downloading, exporting, or importing them into your project. SF Symbols 3 has now a little over 3,000 icons, and that list keeps on growing. I invite you to download the SF Symbols app, this app, from developer.apple.com slash sf-symbols to check the available icons. All of these icons come in different variations such as rendering methods, including monochrome, hierarchical, palette, multicolor, colors, weights, etc. New in SF Symbols 3 was the multicolor category. Those icons are favorable for communicating actions and states. All right, let's get back to our project. Both tab items are aligned horizontally, so we're going to insert an H stack instead of the text view. Then we're going to add a button for expanding the bottom sheet. Button. Initialize with action and label. Enter. The action is our action property that we can call like this. For the label, it's going to be an SF symbol. Image with system name. Map it in ellipse. We can see it here. Finally, we're going to set the frame of the icon with the width 44 and height 44. And by default, the alignment is center. So we can remove this. This is the tab items. As mentioned earlier, the right button is to navigate to the weather screen, which doesn't exist yet. Under the expand button, we're going to add the navigation button. For that, insert a navigation link with destination and label, enter. Since we haven't built the weather screen yet, we're going to leave this empty. As for the label, it's going to be another SF symbol, image with system name, list star. Here too, we're going to set the frame of the icon to width 44, height 44, and remove the alignment. Now, the two icons are clinged together. To push them apart to the end corners, we're going to use the spacer for that between the two buttons. I'm going to remove this slide. Next, let's properly style the tab items. Both buttons have the same styling, so we'll apply it on the H stack as a whole. H stack. Set the font to Title 2, the foreground color to white. And right now, the buttons are even surpassing the corners of the device. So we're going to have to set a padding. Padding. For the paddings, pretty much each side is different. Therefore, we're going to call edge insets for this purpose. Edge insets. Open parenthesis. Use the one with top leading, bottom, and trailing arguments. For the top, it's going to be 20, leading, 32, 
bottom 24 and trailing 32. Now let's put in the tab bar element in home view. Go to home view. After the padding, initialize tab bar with an empty action, just like the preview of the tab bar. Since the tab bar comes with the navigation link, its parent view, which is the home view, will have to be wrapped in a navigation view. There's an easy way to do it. Navigate to home view, command click on ZStack and embed, type in navigation view. That's it. Let's make the preview smaller. There's not extra spacing on top that's supposed to be for the navigation title, but we don't need that. So we can hide the navigation bar with navigation bar hidden on the child view of navigation view, which is ZStack. Here, navigation bar hidden, set it to true. And the hero text has moved back to its position. Let's test the navigation link if it works. We can run the preview by clicking on the play button here and then click on the navigation button. That's right, there's no destination view, but at least we can see the simulation of it. Back. I just want to mention that the reason I didn't add the navigation view in home view right from the beginning is that we can't see the outline of its children at all in the canvas. For example, if I select the VStack or the text view or another text view, the red rectangle is still focused on the whole navigation view. And this is bad for development because we want to see the size and the spacing of these elements. All right, we're not done yet with the tab bar. We've just covered the basics. It's missing all the beautiful design elements, which we'll cover next. Out of the ordinary shapes, definitely add a cool factor to the app. Look at this custom tab bar and there to say otherwise. In this section, we'll draw a custom shape directly in Swift UI using paths. We'll be using that to complete our tab bar. For more complicated shapes like this one, we'll resort to an online helper tool to convert SVG to SwiftUI code. The shape we'll build ourselves is the arc shape that we see as a thin line at the bottom layer of the tab bar. Let's get to it. In the utils folder, add another file, Swift file, call it shapes, Replace foundation by Swift UI. Then declare a new struct arc as a shape. We're provided with the method from shape path that is going to allow us to draw within a rectangular frame serving as our canvas. Thankfully, just type path and use auto completion. In the method that is between the curly braces, we'll instantiate a new path, var path equal to path parenthesis, and we'll use this to combine lines and curves to form a new shape. Let's return path first. To determine the starting point, we can use the move method. Here, path dot move two it's going to be the top left corner so relatively to the rectangle the x and y points are the minimum back to xcode initialize cg point to be x as rect dot min x and y as rect dot min y Next, we'll draw a basic curve using add quad curve to make the rounded line here. Path dot add quad curve 
This method requires an endpoint and a control point. To understand them, let's go over to the documentation of add quad curves from Apple. So we have the current point and we want to go over to the endpoint. The control point specifies the depth of the curve, much like when you use your finger to pull a string or an elastic. The endpoint is going to be the max x and min y of the rectangle. x rect dot max x y is rect dot min y. Whereas the control point is going to be the horizontal and vertical midpoints. CG point x is rect dot mid x and y is going to be rect dot mid y. Now let's try to blend the arc in the tab bar. Go to tab bar on top of the tab items. Add the arc shape, arc. Funny, doesn't it look like a tuxedo to you? We better frame it with the height to resize it. Frame, height, set it to 88. What I want to show you is that the shape closes the path for you by connecting the open points and fill it with its default color. Let's change the color to the tab bar background color. Fill color dot tab bar background. We can barely see it. Let me zoom in a bit. Actually, the fill portion that we want is below the arc line, not above it. We can see it better if we outline the border right away. To add a border to a shape, use the overlay modifier, add the same shape again, stroke it with the color dot tap bar border with the line width of 0.5. Now you can see it. To fix the filling, we'll need to go back to the arc and close its path. Let's pin the tab bar preview so that when we make changes in shapes, we'll see it live. We'll need to add two lines that sort of run through the sides of the device and we'll complete the semi-rectangle shape. Path dot add line to CG point rect dot max x and y rect dot max y. Next path dot add line to CG point x is going to be rect dot min x and y red dot max y. Then instead of adding a new line to close the path, this line path allows us to close it automatically with its close sub path method. Path close sub path. You may omit this also, it'll work the same. Now there's just a little problem remaining and that problem is one pixel wide. We can still see the border where the lines are straight. Well, I'll just have to move the points by one pixel in the outer direction to hide them. Let's do the starting point first. I'll move this point to the left by one pixel while keeping the Y position intact. So min X, minus one. For the second point, I'll move it to the right by one pixel. Max X plus one. For the third point, 
I'll add one pixel in both axes. Max X plus one, max Y plus one. And finally, I'll move this point to the left by one pixel and to the bottom by one pixel. So min X minus one and max Y plus one. And now all the straight lines are hidden. Nice, isn't it? Just so you know, I tried other methods like turning the shape into an insertable shape and apply stroke border instead of just stroke, but in vain. It's just this approach that works for me. The other two custom shapes from the design are in the form of trapezoids and thus more complicated. It's this one. And this one. Don't break your head over it. Trust me, I tried. Just use a helper tool to convert SVG to Swift UI. Actually, Meng has taught this in one of his sections from his iOS 15 course. Go to this online site built by Chasm. It's genius, actually. Back to Figma, copy the shape element of the purple weather widget. Right click, copy paste as, copy as SVG. Then paste the SVG code in the top text box. Click on Convert to Swift UI Shape. Then copy the result to your Xcode project. Paste. You would just have to rename your custom shape to Trapezoid. And voila! You've got your custom shape in seconds. We'll complete the home screen with the remaining element, which is the bottom sheet. In this section, we'll implement the bottom sheet, a draggable sheet that presents additional information on a screen without exiting that screen. It differs from SwiftUI's default sheet in that it offers many snap positions. Bottom sheets are featured abundantly in Apple's apps, such as Maps, Stocks and music. You could build your own custom bottom sheet, but you could cut a few hours of development time with an existing library. Chances are your needs are other people's needs too. They come with pretty fine UI, pretty fine snap positions, drag gestures, transitions and animations, and so on. These features take time to build. That's why I decided to use one of them. I browsed through various libraries for bottom sheets and I found a few good ones. There's this library from Lucas Ziska and this one from Wouter125, but there's only one that has the feature I need, the ability to read real-time position callback while I drag the bottom sheet. Therefore, I settled on this one. To add a library to a project via Swift Package Manager, go to File, Add Packages. In the Search field, enter the repo's URL address. Go to GitHub, copy the URL, and paste it here. I'm going to attach the main branch for the dependency rule and then click on Add Package, and again. Once it's finished installing the library, you'll be able to see it in your app's info, here and here. Let's close these tabs and unpin the tab bar. All right, these libraries usually provide you with default positions such as bottom, middle, top, and even hidden, all of which you have the option to lock them. You can even choose to set your own position, whether it's relative to the screen size or in an absolute position. Our library's bottom sheet view 
has three props, header, content, and position. The position will be a binding value, which means it will be able to listen to updates both ways and is recognized by the dollar sign in front. Therefore, before adding the bottom sheet view, we first need to set up the custom enum for resting position, like so. Let's do that in home view where we'll host all things related to the bottom sheet. Scroll to the top, enum, bottom sheet, position of type CG float and let it conform to case iterable. As I mentioned earlier, there are two kinds of positioning. Relative positioning values are fractions of the screen's height and are limited between zero and one. Absolute positioning values are the vertical position regardless of the screen's height and are greater than one. The library will know whether it's relative or absolute based on those values. Our bottom sheet will only need two cases, top and middle. And their values are a fraction of the screen's height and can be found in the design. Let's go to Figma and get the height of this bottom sheet. It's 325 and the screen size is 844. So that's equivalent to 0.385. I'm going to comment this so you know. For the top version of the bottom sheet, let's go to the components page. Zoom in. It's 702, so that's equal to 0 0.83. Before going on further, let's import bottom sheet and resume the canvas. I can do that with my keyboard too. Just press on Option, Command, P. Since the position argument is of type binding, we'll have no choice to store in a state. On line 17, at state bar, bottom sheet, position of type bottom sheet position, and stick it in the middle position for starters. Dot middle. Now you can go ahead and add bottom sheet view right above the tab bar. Go to the markers and navigate to tab bar. Bottom sheet view and initialize with position, header, and Compton. For the position, pass in the binding bottom sheet position. For the header, click on enter and remove the code. Resume. I'm going to reduce the canvas size. Right now, nothing is showing because we haven't dropped in any header or content yet. That's what we're going to do next. If your design has a sticky header in the bottom sheet, the header is going to become handy. For example, to check out the sheet's transition, Let's display the bottom sheet position value on screen. Here, text, bottom sheet, position. Since it's an enum, we need its raw value and formatted to string, dot formatted. You should see it now on the preview. Let me zoom in a little bit, 0385. You can run the preview now and try to drag the bottom sheet up and down. 0.83 and back to 0.385. All right, that's a good start. In our case, there's no header, so we can comment out the text view. 
As for the content, we're going to refer to a new view called forecast view, which will create a new file for it under the detail folder. New file, CFUI view, forecast view. Resume. The whole bottom sheet is scrollable, so start with the scroll view. Then we'll change its background color to color dot bottom sheet background and clip shape it to a rounded rectangle with corner radius 44. Next, we'll draw a separator to clearly outline the border. There are actually two versions, the middle one and the top one. We'll do this one first. The separator will still be visible after scrolling the content. That means that it's laid on top of the scroll view. This acts like a border, so we'll add an overlay to the scroll view. Overlay, enter. Then insert a divider for the bottom sheet separator. And change its background color to color dot bottom sheet border top. If I zoom in a little bit, it's hard to see the line. So let's set a background color to the preview. Color dot background and change it to dark mode. Preferred color scheme, dark. Now we can see it, but it's at the middle. We'll move it to the top of the model by setting its frame to max height to infinity and alignment top. If you zoom in and look carefully, you can see that the line is outside of the model's bounds. To fix that, Clip shape it to a rounded rectangle with corner radius 44, the same shape as the bottom sheet. Finally, blend it with the mode overlay before the background modifier. Blend mode, overlay. Let's handle the drag indicator now. As an overlay to the scroll view once more, Place a rounded rectangle of corner radius 10 and fill it with the color black at opacity 0 0.3. The size of this indicator is 48 by 5. So frame it with the width 48, height five, no alignment. Then frame it again to a height of 20. That way it'll stay in the middle of that container as in the design. Finally, bear with me, push it to the top with another frame, just like we did for the separator. Frame, max height, Infinity, Alignment, Top. With the separator and the drag indicator done, we can now see a resemblance of a bottom sheet. So if we drag it later, we can view it better. Mark this as the drag indicator. All right, let's test it out in home view. Play. Not bad. We can also permit the change in its position without dragging it on the tab of the left button in the tab bar. Remember that we already included an argument for the action here? Well, 
just update the bottom sheet position to top. Bottom sheet position equal to top and done. Let's try the tab action. It works. Good. Right now, the bottom sheet is somewhat transparent. That's not going to be helpful when we'll be inserting the components inside. We're going to add a blur effect to hide what's in the background to blend everything together. Background blur is a very trendy effect in any design. The blur effect looks like a frosted glass. It's a layer of blur view being inserted between the content and the background underneath. You would most see it on cards, models, navigation bars, and tab bars. Not only it's beautiful, but it's also practical in bringing focus to the content in front. For example, in our iOS app, you would see it on the tab bar, the profile icon, the tutorial cards, the live stream cards, and on the more screen. In fact, background blur is the main facet in glass morphism design style such as this one and this one. By the way, this is Dribble. It's a website where a network of designers post their work. You can find tons of inspirations here. In the design, both the bottom sheet and the custom nav bar contains a blur background. In this section, we'll learn how to blend in a built-in material blur as well as a custom blur backdrop. Since iOS 15, you can opt to add a blur effect to any background directly in SwiftUI with just one line of code without resorting to UIKit, which is the older framework for iOS development. This is a huge improvement. The blur layer is referred to as material and a range from ultra thin to ultra thick in terms of transparency level. Let's now add the background blur to our bottom sheet. Go to forecast view, and after the background color for the scroll view, add another background modifier and use the ultra thin material. Although the material blur works most of the times, but unfortunately, it adds a colored layer in between, a grayish for dark mode and whitish for light mode. Let me change to the light mode so you can see that. Change the color scheme to light. There. This is not the effect we want and definitely what's not intended in the design. I was searching extensively online to figure a way to do this in SwiftUI and finally came across a Stack Overflow answer that provided me with a solution. Thanks to the person who posted that. Funny enough, it was downvoted, so probably a lot of people skipped reading it. It seems that Apple is using a backdrop layer as part of the default navigation and tab bars, and we can pull that out for our own usage. This layer is the CA backdrop layer, a subclass of CA layer, and applies a filter with overlay blend mode to the view behind it. In short, it's practical for blending layers on iOS. Let's get to build our own custom background blur. Create a new Swift UI file under the components folder. Name it Blur. Under the import line, declare a new class UI Backdrop View as a UI View. Then we'll declare a variable layer class Override class var layer class of type any class and will retrieve from ns class from string the class name 
CA backdrop layer. As worn by Xcode, this is an optional, so we'll provide a default value. Click on fix, and the default value would be the CA layer dot self. Next, we'll create a backdrop struct. Struct backdrop. To be able to use a UI kit view inside Swift UI, we'll need to abide by the UI view representable protocol. UI view representable. This protocol requires two methods. Make UI view when creating the view initially and update UI view for updating it when states change. What's easy is that we can just type make and update and Xcode will provide the auto completion code. Make UI view. Update UI view. Let's replace some UI view and UI view type to UI backdrop view to be more specific. We'll return the UI backdrop view inside the make UI view. And since this view doesn't need to be updated, we'll leave the closure inside update UI view empty. Now let's use that backdrop in our blur component. In the body, return backdrop and blur it. Since we'll be using this as a component, we should extend these props to allow customization. So declare properties, radius, of type CG float. Let's set the default value of three and opaque Boolean and set it to false. Now I use these properties as the arguments of the blur modifier. Resume. Now to any background you wish to add a blur layer, just apply the background modifier with the blur view. Go to forecast view. We'll replace the ultra thin material with the blur view and initialize it with radius and opaque. Set the radius to 25 and opaque to true. Move it up a line since technically it's supposed to be a layer underneath the regular background. And before I forget, I'm going to turn this back to the dark mode. We could even take it a step further and make an extension to view. Go to extensions, make an extension, view, and add a method background blur. Use the same arguments as before, radius as a CG float with the default value of three and opaque as a bool with a default value of false. It's going to return some view and then return cell dot background initialize blur with radius and opaque then you'll be able to use it like this instead of the background modifier call the background blur modifier and set the radius to the same values as above and delete this line Let's go check the preview of the home view instead because we don't see much here. That's what I'm talking about. 
Love it. I hope you like this technique too. If you ever know of another method that would give the same result as mine, let me know. I would love to hear about it. Drop shadows and inner shadows are common practices for creating a 3D visual effect to UI elements. For instance, each of these cards have a drop shadow and there's an inner shadow on the search bar. They can be seen in many design styles and are an absolute must in neuromorphism. Neuromorphism emphasizes the 3D effect and it really gives you the impression that the elements are raised or sunken. In this section, we'll learn how to apply an inner shadow and furthermore turn this aspect into a reusable technique. In the design, the border of the bottom sheet is depicted as the inner shadow. Let me show you. Let me expand the model and select the rectangle shape. Scroll down on the design. This is the inner shadow. If we hide it, you can see that the border is hidden. I think it's because the border would surround the whole bottom sheet, whereas we just want the top border. Let's get the coding. We can close the blur and extensions tabs now. Go to forecast view. To the scroll view, we're going to add another overlay right before the first one. Overlay. We'll add a marker for the inner shadow slash border. We're going to add the same shape, rounded rectangle with corner radius 44 and stroke it with the color white and the line width one. You might have noticed that the method starts off the same as the borders. Then we're going to offset with Y at one pixel and blur it to create a shadow. In this case, there's no blur radius. Finally, we'll mask it within the bounds of the shape itself, which is rounded rectangle of corner radius 44. That's going to cut off the outer shadow. This is generally how we create an inner shadow. To comply with our design, we'll stick an additional overlay blend mode to the border. Here, after the stroke, blend mode, overlay. If you look at the design, there is this gradual fade out of the border along the rounded corners. Let me zoom in a little bit. Here and there. Like we've just seen, the inner shadow requires that you draw the same shape, but in a thick line. To get around this in SwiftUI, we'll play with the color instead. We've gone over a gradient that distributes the colors evenly along the way. This time, we'll make use of gradient stops that lets you specify the location where the change in color happened. This location value is between zero and one. In extensions, you can check the bottom sheet border middle to see how it's done. I switched the color white to clear at 20% of the way. So back to forecast view, replace the white color to the custom color to hide the border gradually on the other sides of the bottom sheet. Let me run the preview so we can hide the red selection. Color dot bottom sheet border middle. Did you catch that? Usually when we tend to manipulate the same method again and again, it would be a good idea to turn it into something reusable. This is so true for borders and inner shadows because the shape has to be reiterated. 
in the extensions file, we're going to make another extension to view. Then add a new method in the shadow. Funk inner shadow. The shape will conform to the shape protocol and the color to the shape style protocol. We can specify the arguments types in the angle brackets. S for shape and SS for shape style. Then add all the arguments we need for the inner shadow. In parentheses, shape as type S, which refers to shape. Color, SS, for shape style. Line, width, CG float, equal to 1. Offset X, CG float, equal to 0. Offset Y. CG float equal to zero also. Blur CG float equal four. Blend mode of type blend mode. Make it normal by default. And it's going to return some view. In the closure, we're going to return self. Next, cut the block of code from forecast view, including the overlay. And paste it as a modifier to self. Then we're going to change the constant values to the argument values. First, let's replace the rounded rectangle by shape. Remove the marker. Color. Line width. Blend mode. For the offset, add X. Offset X. Y. Offset Y for the blur radius, it's blur. Then replace the rounded rectangle with the shape again inside the mask. Actually, I can also change the mask structure to parentheses instead. Shape. Remove these lines. Now I'm going to get ahead and allow the argument opacity to be passed in. The reason is that you've probably guessed it. The bottom sheet's border changes between the two positions. So we're going to use the opacity for that. Here, add the argument opacity as a double equal to one, which means it's going to be visible by default. Then add the opacity modifier and pass in the opacity value. Once the view extension is established, you'll be able to use it as any other modifier. Go back to forecast view, where we had cut the inner shadow with the overlay, replace it with the inner shadow modifier with all of these arguments. Shape is rounded rectangle, corner radius 44, color is color dot bottom sheet middle line with one offset x zero offset y one blur zero blend mode overlay and opacity one next we will include some animations that will sync with the drag gesture of the bottom sheet every app has to involve animations they're like the spices in the dish Animations are captivating and take out the boring aspect during the browsing experience 
or user interaction. For example, I just showed you a few animations in our iOS design code app. In the prototype, there are many elements that slide up or down while dragging the bottom sheet. The obvious ones are the images and the hero text. To achieve this, we can make use of the transition modifier or create a custom animatable modifier, but we won't use neither of them. We'll go another way, a combination of geometry reader and a progressive state to create a smooth transition. The first thing we need is a state that will capture the live position value when we drag the bottom sheet. Remember the value we showed in the header before? Well, let's put that in a state. Go to the top on line 18, at state var bottom sheet translation as a CG float. And we'll start off with the middle position's raw value to match the bottom sheet position. Equal bottom sheet position dot middle dot raw value. As I said before, the bottom sheet library I chose gives us the ability to read its translation value. We can use its method on bottom sheet drag to get that value. Let's navigate to bottom sheet. Here on bottom sheet drag, translation in, then we can use this translation value to save to your new state. Bottom sheet translation equal translation. To check the translation value, uncomment the text inside the header and replace this by bottom sheet translation instead. Resume. There we go. Let's drag this up and we can see the translation value updating live. Very nice. You'll notice that the return translation value is in terms of screen height. Right now it's around 325, but the initial value is actually 0 0.385. Therefore, we need to convert it to a fraction of the height instead to match the initial state. So what we're going to do is to embed the Z stack embed in geometry reader. Geometry reader has a proxy that's going to allow us to read the size and coordinate space of the elements that it wraps. Here, geometry in. So geometry is the proxy. If you read the screen height from UI screen dot main dot bounds and rotate the device, it won't get updated. So geometry reader is usually a better choice. Next, we're going to declare a constant for the screen height to make things easier. Let screen height, it's going to be the height from the geometry side. So geometry dot size dot height. We'd also want to include the top and bottom of the save area insets for obtaining the full height of the screen. Plus geometry dot safe area inset dot top plus geometry safe area insets bottom. Next, we're going to divide the translation by the screen height to turn it into a fraction. Divide by screen height. Now drag up and down again to verify the updated value. So that's settled. I'm going to move down a line the navigation bar hidden because it's usually set as the first child of the navigation view. So we have the translation value in percentage, but it begins at 0 0.385 and ends at 0 
If you want to change, for example, the opacity of an element, these numbers won't do it. The range should be from 0 to 1. We would have to prorate it and not only that, there are many elements to animate, so we shouldn't be parading for each of them. Therefore, the smart approach would be to make it available for all of them. It's going to be so much more efficient, you see. To prorate the translation value, we're going to declare a computed property. What is a computed property? It's a property that returns something based on a counterpart property. To do that, go to the top, underneath the bottom sheet translation, declare bottom sheet translation pro rated as a CG float. This property will read the variation in the bottom sheet translation by the total variation. So bottom sheet translation minus bottom sheet position dot middle dot raw value divided by bottom sheet position dot top dot raw value minus bottom sheet position dot middle dot raw value. This is just pure math for prorating. Now in the header, we're going to switch the text to bottom sheet translation prorated to check it out. Resume, zero and one, perfect. With all the preparation done, we're set to add the animations on this home screen. Let's begin with the images. Go to the body. We're going to define a constant. Let image offset. That is the screen height plus 36 to ensure it moves outside of the screen. Then. We're going to offset the background image on the y-axis by minus bottom sheet translation paraded times the image offset. And we're going to do the same with the house image. So copy this line of code, paste it here. Let's try that. And we've got our first animation. Hooray! Next on the list, we'll animate the block of text in the same manner. Scroll down a bit after the top padding. Offset. Y. Minus bottom sheet translation prorated. Times 46 this time. We'll also reduce the spacing of the VStack gradually times 1 minus bottom sheet translation prorated. Let's test that. As well, we'll start hiding the tab bar as soon as we begin dragging the bottom sheet. Go to tab bar and offset Y bottom sheet translation paraded times 115. Let's see. There you go. Now the tab bar is hidden. Let's move on to the opacity animation now. Navigate to current weather, to the high and low temperature text. We're going to render it invisible at the end of the drag gesture. So add the opacity modifier. It's going to be one minus bottom sheet translation prorated. Paste it. 
pay attention to this text. To take care of the next animations, we'll require a new drag state that's going to tell if the bottom sheet has been dragged to the top or not. Go to Home View. We'll add a new state. Add state var has dragged of type bool equal to false by default. Then navigate to bottom sheet. We'll change that state in the closure of the bottom sheet drag here. If bottom sheet position equal equal bottom sheet position dot top set has drag to true else set has drag to false. We're also going to include the animation by wrapping the if else statement in with animation. Use the is in out animation and move this inside the closure. Delete this line. That way, any elements modifier that is depending on this state will get animated. You'll see what I mean later. With the has drag state available, we're now able to change the attribute string for when the bottom sheet is at the middle versus at the top. Scroll down a bit to attribute string. For starters, the size of the temperature should be changed to 20 pixel at the end. This is how we're going to do it. Wrap 96 in parentheses, minus parentheses, bottom sheet translation prorated, minus parentheses again, 96 minus 20. Let me explain. Initially, the size is 96. When it's over, this value will get to 1, and all of this cancels out each other. And we're left with 20. At the same time, the two minus signs will turn positive. Additionally, let's switch between the pipe and the line break. Here, wrapping parenthesis has dragged question mark if so space pipe bar space so this is a ternary operator we call it it's a short for if else statement if has drag is true show the pipe otherwise it's a line break then we're going to animate the opacity of the pipe. After secondary, add the opacity modifier, bottom sheet translation, prorated. However, here's the problem. Unfortunately, since SwiftUI uses an enum for the foreground color and the font weight, the transition won't be seamless. We'll still animate them on the temperature though. So on the weight has drag question mark semi bold else thin for the foreground color has dragged if so secondary else primary. On a side note, you could maybe try to update the opacity of the white color instead of secondary, but it won't end up as a secondary color. It will be close though. My bad. This minus sign should be a multiplication sign instead. Resume. 
Let's run our test on the attributed string animation. Drag this up. Ooh. We're getting there. All right, the last animation to perform is the inner shadow of the bottom sheet, aka top border. Go to forecast view. We're going to add a property bottom sheet translation prorated so we can pass that value from home view. Here, var bottom sheet translation prorated of type CG float and will default to one at first. Then update the opacity of the inner shadow to one minus bottom sheet translation prorated. Back to home view, we're going to navigate to bottom sheet and pass bottom sheet translation prorated in forecast view. That's it. Resume and we're going to test that out. Keep an eye on the border here. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to delete this line and comment out the header text again. We won't be needing it anymore. Coming up, we'll get down to putting content in the bottom sheet, starting off with the segmented control. It's quite empty right now. In this section, we'll implement the segmented control found at the top of the bottom sheet that will let us toggle between forecast periods. Of course, we'll incorporate the selection animation too in all its glory. A segmented control is a set of multiple segments of equal width that act as buttons. They are used to separate or filter similar content and allow switching between them. They're easily recognized in the form of horizontal toggles. A good example would be the calendar app where you could see the calendar periods to present events in different time frames. Another segmented control that we can find is the inbox to filter the new and the replied events. Let's get started. We can close the extensions file now. Let's create a new file under the components folder. SufUI view called segmented control. The elements inside are stacked vertically, so we'll start with a V stack with a spacing of five. And there'll be a top padding of 25. Resume. Then inside the container, we'll place the control buttons in an H stack button with action and label, enter. Leave the action empty for now. For the label, it's going to be a text that says hourly forecast. Let's copy this one and paste for another button. Change hourly to weekly. Then to the whole H stack, we'll set the font to subheadline with a weight of semi bold and the foreground color to secondary. Right now, the intuitive thing to do is to insert a spacer between the two button to push them apart. However, if you rotate the device, the buttons would be laid at the end of the screen, which I find won't be aligned with the highlight under it. So I'd rather them be centered in two columns. To distribute space evenly, we can go with the geometry reader or the lazy V grid approaches, but we'll take a switch shortcut here. Let's undo. To make two equal width columns, use the frame modifier on the button. 
and set the min width to zero and max width to infinity. Then copy this, we'll apply the same frame to the other button. As simple as that. Let's add in the button's actions. To capture the user selection, we're going to add a binding state variable. Here, add binding var selection as an integer. Binding because we'll also need this value in the forecast view to present either the hourly or weekly forecast. We're going to need to fix the preview by adding a constant value for it. Click on fix. Dot constant. Pass in zero. Then for the first button, we're going to store the selection value to zero and one for the other button. With the add binding comes the add state property wrapper. Go to forecast view and declare a state for selection as well. At state, private bar selection, and default it to zero. While we're here, we're going to add the segmented control component in the scroll view. Add a V stack with a spacing of 20. This is the segmented control and call segmented control, pass in the binding selection. Resume. Before we continue, we should pin the preview of the home view because it's going to be hard to see the lines that we'll be creating now under the button stack. Pin this and go back to segmented control. I'm going to make the preview bigger. Now let's add those lines. For the separator, add a divider under the segmented buttons. Then change its background color to white at opacity 0 0.5 and apply a drop shadow with color black at opacity 0 0.2, radius 0, x 0, and y 1. Finally, blend each of these modifiers with the mode overlay. Blend mode, overlay. Blend mode, overlay. This is the separator. For showing the selected segment, we'll display the underline right under the button. To the divider, add an overlay, then divider, change its background color to color dot underline, then set its frame width to half of the screen's width. UI screen dot main dot bounce dot width divided by two height to three and no alignment. We'll overlay blend again. Blend mode overlay. Right now, its size is indeed half of the screen, but it's in the center. To align it to the left side, we're going to embed the divider in an H stack and frame it with the max width to infinity and alignment leading. Finally, we'll offset on the y-axis negative one pixel to move it up a little bit. 
Oops, this is the underline. Finally, let's take care of the selection animation. It's going to be easy with the way we've set things up. Just update the frames alignment based on the selection state. Is the selection equal to zero? If so, lead it. Otherwise, trailing. And now we can try to switch the tabs up. Reduce the canvas size, run the preview. Not bad, but we can make the transition along the line much smoother. And for that, we're going to use the width animation function when we update the selection state. Scroll to the top here, width animation. We can additionally specify the animation timing curve and duration, like so. Dot is in out with duration 0 0.5 second. Note that the default animation is is in out with the duration of 0 0.35 second. Then move this line up. We're going to do the same with the other selection. With animation, is in out, duration 0 0.5. Move the selection line up and delete this line. Now let's try the animation again. Much better. Next on the line to place in the bottom sheet are the forecast cards. However, we would need to set up the data first to showcase them properly. Data is crucial to any application. Without it, it's just not sustainable. We wouldn't know what to show or how. That's why data infrastructure is so important. In this section, we'll organize the data model for the weather forecast along with composing different sets of static data in order to present these cards later on. Back to Xcode, we cannot pin the preview now. Let's kick off with creating a new file under the models folder. New file, Swift file this time, name it forecast model. First, we'll create an enum that will list the options for the forecast period. Enum, forecast period. The cases will be hourly and daily. For the data modeling that ensues, it's going to involve a lot of repetitive typing. Therefore, I included this file along with all the code in the downloadable source files. You may just drag and drop this file into your Xcode project. As for me, heads up, I will be copying and pasting a lot to buy us some time. All right, we'll do the same for the weather. Enum, weather, and we'll provide the string value as well. So make it a tight string. And I'll paste all the cases. Reindent all of this. I'm not sure why the color is not correct, so I'll just delete this and put it back. Next, we'll declare the data model for the forecast. Struct forecast. Make it conform to identifiable. That means we'll have to add an ID property. Var ID. We can set its value randomly by calling UUID. That way, it's always going to be unique. Include the remaining properties like so. Let's review them. The forecast model is going to include date as a date weather of type weather we just created, probability, temperature, high, low as an integer, and location as a string. I'm going to fix the color again. 
When we'll be implementing the forecast cards and widgets, we're going to pass in the forecast data. But how are we going to pull the associated icons? By mapping the weather with the icon's name. So let's declare a computed property inside forecast. Var icon of type string. And using the switch statement, we'll enumerate all the weather cases and return the corresponding icon name. Switch weather. Make sure to select the option with the ellipsis, that is the three dots, so that Xcode fills in all the cases for you. Of course, I'm going to be pasting all the cases again. Note that this method allows you to return different versions of icons. For instance, you could return a different string if it's day or night. Moving along, let's pick some fake data to show in the forecast cards. We'll wrap these data in an extension to forecast. Extension. Forecast. First, it's going to be easier if we declare constants for the hour and the day in terms of seconds since the time we'll be referring. Time interval is counted in seconds. Static. Let hour of type time interval, which is another term for double, equal 60 times 60. Likewise, static let day as a time interval, 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 24 hours. Then we'll create the hourly data, static, let hourly, which is an array of forecasts, equal square brackets, and I'll paste all the data. As you can see, we initialize the dates relative to now using time interval since now. And we're going to present each hour from the hour before to four hours from now. For the daily data, I'll just paste everything. It's the same concept, except that I replace hour by day in the multiplication. While we're here, we'll also set the data up for the city's forecast to be shown in the weather widgets on the second screen. Scroll down, paste. The distinction here is that all the dates are the current time and the locations are different. In this section, we're going to implement the forecast card component with the data that we've set up earlier. Moreover, we'll manage the state of the card's color depending on the current time or day. Let's get started. Under the components folder, create yet another file, Swift UI view, name it forecast card. We can close the forecast model and segmented control files now. Resume. This component is going to accept three props. The first one is forecast of type forecast. The second one is forecast period as forecast period. And lastly is active as a bool and will default it to true. The preview is now going to ask you some values for these props. So click on fix. We'll specify the forecast to be the first item of the hourly data. Forecast dot hourly square bracket zero. For the forecast period, specify hourly. 
Now we're going to start off with a Z stack for this view. We zoom and I'm going to reduce the canvas size. Let's work on the shape of the card. It's obviously going to be a rounded rectangle, right? So rounded rectangle with corner radius 30. We'll fill it with the reserved color. Fill. Color. Dot forecast card background. And we're going to change its opacity based on the is active property. Is active. Set it to 1. Else 0 0.2. Then frame it with the width 60. Height 146, no alignment or center. And finally, we're going to add a drop shadow with the color black at opacity 0 0.25, radius 10, x5, and y4. Maybe I should make the preview bigger so you can all see it well. Just so you know, you can change the default value of is active to false to check the other color. We zoom. There. Back. Resume again. We're going to outline the card's border now. To the rounded rectangle, add an overlay. It's going to be the same shape. Rounded rectangle, corner radius 30. We'll call the stroke border modifier this time instead of stroke because in Figma, if I go to the card component, the stroke is designed as an inside border. So stroke border. The color is going to be white at opacity. Its color opacity is going to rely on the is active prop as well. Is active 0 0.5, otherwise 0 0.2. Then blend it with the mode overlay. Blend mode overlay. Resume. To finalize the card styling, we'll add an inner shadow with using the custom view modifier we created previously. Under the overlay, inner shadow, the shape is going to be rounded rectangle, corner radius 30, the color white at opacity 0 0.25, line width 1, offset x1, offset Y1, blur 0, blend mode overlay, and I'll remove the opacity. We'll move on to the content now. After the inner shadow, add a V stack with a spacing of 16. Let's style its container by padding it. Padding, horizontal, 8, and padding, vertical, 16. Then set the constant frame size of width, 60, height, 146. Remove the alignment. The initial content we'll insert is the forecast date. Add a text view, forecast dot date. We have the option to specify the data's format type if it's not a string. For that, add the format argument. We're going to present it in daytime format, the hour or weekday, depending if it's hourly or daily forecast. So, is the forecast period equal to forecast period 
done hourly if so daytime dot hour else daytime dot weekday then we're going to change its fun to sub at line with a weight of semi bold next we'll stack the icon and probability text together in a vstack vstack with the spacing of minus four the stack is going to have a frame height of 42 we'll add the icon first image forecast dot icon we'll need to suffix this with the word small as this is going to be the small version of the icon let's turn this into a string literal by adding quotes and wrapping the variable in backslash and parenthesis then type small for the probably text add another text view forecast dot probability will format it in percent format dot percent then we're going to style it with a font of footnote in weight semi bold change its foreground color to color dot probability text Furthermore, we're only going to show it if the probability is greater than zero. So we'll apply the opacity based on that value. Opacity is the forecast dot probability greater than zero. If so, one else zero. I find that modifying the opacity is going to maintain the position and spacing versus wrapping the whole text view inside an if statement. Put in the forecast temperature after that. Under the inner V stack, text, we're going to add a string literal again. So quotes, backslash, the variable is going to be forecast dot temperature. And we'll add the degree symbol with the keys shift option eight. Set its font to title three. For this card component, the last matter to tend to is to turn the is active value dynamic since the date passed in is a variable. What we want is to make the purple color bolder when the forecast is at the moment present, which means we have to compare the date time of the forecast to now. Let's convert this store property to a computed property instead. Easy. All you have to do is to replace the default value to curly braces instead. Now, there are two types of forecast period, hourly or daily. So we have to take that into account. If forecast period is equal to forecast period dot hourly, then let is hour equal. We can determine if two dates are equal by calling the is date method from calendar dot current calendar dot current dot is date choose the one with equal to to granularity we'll compare now to the forecast date to the granularity hour then return is hour else 
let is today equal we can copy this block of code and change the hour to day as the granularity to compare then again return is today resume now the color is lighter since the forecast data entered in the preview is the previous hour we can change it to the second element of the array to verify if it works fine one good my bad what i meant for this variable was is this hour With the card component ready, we're good to go to exhibit them in a carousel that is a collection of scrollable cards. In this section, we'll display the forecast cards in two collections, one for the hourly forecast and one for the daily forecast. Afterwards, we'll integrate the scrolling animation on switch of this collection. Due to the forecast cards being available now, we can display them in forecast view. Close the forecast card tab and go to forecast view. Under the segmented control, we'll place the forecast cards here. Insert a scroll view with the horizontal axis. We also have the option to turn off the scroll bar which shows indicator set to false. Click on enter for the content. Let's add a horizontal padding to it. Padding, horizontal, 20. Then inside the scroll view, we're going to add an H stack with a spacing of 12. Then we're going to loop the hourly forecast data with for each. Forecast dot hourly curly braces forecast in and call the forecast card component pass in the appropriate values to the arguments forecast hourly let me reduce the canvas a bit let's run the preview and try to scroll the cards sweet not sure if you have noticed but the cards shadows are cut at the top and the bottom of the scroll view let me zoom in a little bit so you can see better There's a line here, you see? The reason being that the scroll view's height is the same as the cards, but the shadows are surpassing them. To resolve this, we'll add a vertical padding to the H stack. Padding, vertical, 20. And we'll adjust the spacing of the V stack to zero. Now there should be room between the horizontal stack and the scroll view for the shadows. The end result for the spacing is the same too. In fact, we're going to show different card contents based on the selection of the segmented control. To do that, we're going to embed for each in an if else statement by command clicking on it make conditional if the selection value is equal to zero we're going to show this hourly data else copy this we're going to show the daily data change hourly to daily and the forecast period to daily also now let's see if it works Isn't this awesome? Currently, the content changes, but there's no animation. In Figma's prototyping demo, the transition 
is a scroll in and scroll out effect. I guess I've showed you this many times already. To render that animation effect, we'll apply the transition modifier to both for each. Transition. And we'll offset it with an X value greater than the screen's width minus 430. Let's do the same for the other for each. Transition. Offset. X 430 this time. Bear in mind that I set a constant value for the offset, but in reality, we should maybe read the width of the scroll view or the H stack. That should scroll through all the cars during the animation. If you choose a smaller value, it might cut some end cards out. All right, let's test it out again. Click on the buttons. I don't know why it's incorrect here, but to see the animation properly, head over to Home View. Click on Run. I'm going to reduce the canvas size. And try to switch on the tabs. You see, this is how it should be. Go back to Forecast View. At this point, the bottom sheet is completed. However, when you expand to the detail view, which is exactly this view, it's missing the widgets below the cards. To save time, I've included the image version of those widgets as part of the assets. Under the images folder, it's this one. It's going to be way too long to implement all of them. Yet, I didn't want to leave white space there. So under the forecast cards, we're going to place the forecast widgets. Image, forecast, widgets. And we're going to set the opacity based on the bottom sheet translation paraded value. Okay, let me reduce the preview so we can see the whole screen. How about we test dragging up the bottom sheet in home view again? Yes. All right, this wraps up the first screen of this app, the home screen. Going forward, we'll tackle the next screen, which is the weather screen that contains the custom navigation bar the search bar, and pretty widgets below them. A navigation bar is that sticky header that you can find in almost any applications. It lets us navigate from one screen to another. In technical terms, it's push and pop screens. In most cases, it contains a title to help us situate the current screen we're on or the previous screen we can go back to. Previously, I showed you how easy it is to add a navigation bar in the SwiftUI app. Just simply by inserting navigation view. For our app, we'll put together our own custom navigation bar while keeping the same functionalities. Let's begin by creating a SwiftUI file inside the navigation folder. For navigation bar. We can close the forecast view now. Resume. We'll start with the V stack since there are two rows of elements. V stack with a spacing of eight. On the first row, we'll put an H stack to wrap the buns. H stack. And this stack is going to have a frame with the height of 52. Then add the navigation back button on the left edge. Button with action and label. Leave the action empty for now. Its label is going to be an SF symbol. 
image with the system name chevron dot lab. Set the font to system with size 23 and weight medium. And change the foreground color to secondary. This is the icon for the label. It's just a text that says weather. Set its font to title and its foreground color to primary. We're going to adjust the spacing between the icon and the label by embedding them in an H stack. So command click on image, embed in H stack. Move the marker down and the text up inside the H stack. And this is the label. The H tag is going to have a spacing of five. The alternative would be a label view, which is a stack of icon and title, but you can change the spacing between them. Then set the frame of the H tag with the height of 44. I'm going to make the preview bigger. On the right side, we'll place another SF symbol, which is supposed to be the more button. Image. System name. Ellipsis dot circle. We're going to change its font size to system with size 28. Then set the frame with the width of 44, height 44. And I'll set the frame alignment to trailing to preserve the position as in the design. But I think ideally it should be centered. Trailing. Also insert a spacer to separate the left and the right content. Spacer. We're going to continue with styling the container of the nav bar. Here, we'll first frame it with the height of 106 and align its content to the top within that frame. Then set the horizontal padding of 16 and a vertical padding of Two, then apply a background color of color dot navbar background. We'd want to position the navbar on top of the screen. Therefore, frame it with max height infinity and alignment top. Finally, since it's meant to be a nav bar, we'll make sure to ignore the safe area. Ignore safe area. Consequently, we'll adjust the top padding to account for the top safe area because right now it's too close to the top border. So change 2 to 49. Oh, actually, this should be a top padding instead of vertical. All right. As you know by now, the default nav bar has its own background blur using material blur. But our nav bar has that same blur effect as the bottom sheet. So add our custom background blur modifier. Background blur. Radius 20. Opaque true. Now we can see the blur effect very well, can't we? So let's create the view that will showcase it. Under the detail folder, append a new file, SwiftUI view. It's going to be 
weather view. We're going to make a Z stack and lay down the background color at the bottom of the stack. Same as in home view, color dot background, ignore safe area. Let's resume. Of course, we'll be plugging in our own custom nav bar, so we'll hide the default one. As a modifier to the Z stack, navigation bar hidden, set it to true. Let's add in the navigation bar as an overlay to the Z stack, as it's supposed to be on top of all the content. Here, overlay, navigation bar. I'd suggest to change the mode to dark so we can see the right foreground color. Preferred color scheme, dark. Let's not forget to activate the navigation to this new weather view in the tab bar button. Go to tab bar, here, the destination view for the navigation link is going to be weather view. We should test it out in home view. Go to home view, resume, run the preview, and tap on the navigation button. Nice. But we can come back, so this is what we're going to do next. Go to navigation bar, scroll to the top. To be able to go back to the previous screen in the navigation chain, we can retrieve the dismiss method from the at environment property wrapper. Here, at environment, with keypad, backslash, dot, dismiss. And store it in a property with the same name, var, dismiss. Resume. Then we'll just simply call dismiss as the back button's action. On line 18, dismiss. Now let's test that out again in home view. Resume. Go to the next screen and back. It works. We're able to navigate back. Before we add the search bar inside the navigation bar, we should show some content first so that when we perform the search, we would be able to see the return results. Next, we'll be implementing the content of the weather screen, which are the beautiful weather widgets with the custom shape and large weather icons. We're going to create our last file under Components, New File, Swift UI View. This is for the weather. Widget. We can close the tab bar now. Resume. This widget will need the forecast data similarly to forecast card. So, var forecasts of type forecast. Let's pass in the first element of the city's array in the preview. Forecast dot cities square brackets zero. Resume. At the same time, change it to dark mode. Preferred color scheme dark. For the body, there's going to be the purple background card at the bottom and the content on top. Therefore, wrap a Z stack. With alignment bottom and set its frame to width 342, height 184, and alignment bottom also. The shape of the card is custom, right? Remember that we already created that shape in the file shapes? This one? Well, it's time to put it to use. Make an instance of Chaprizoid and fill it with the 
color dot weather widget background. Then frame it with the width of 342 and height 174, no alignment. Let's make the preview bigger. For the content on the top layer, we're going to add an H tag with alignment bottom. Then a V stack with alignment of leading, spacing of eight. Then we'll present the forecast temperature in big text. Let's start with a string literal forecast dot temperature and add the degree symbol with shift option eight. We're going to make the font with system size 64. Then we'll enclose the rest of the elements in another V stack. with alignment, leading also, spacing two. And inside it, we're going to insert the forecast temperature range. Tech, H columns, add the variable forecast.high, degree, space space l add the variable forecast dot low and insert the degree symbol then set its font to footnote and foreground color to secondary right under the high and low temperatures put in the forecast location text Forecast dot location. Set its font to body. We're going to make sure the text won't surpass one line for long cities and countries name. So set the line limit to one. For the right column, we're going to make another V stack. V stack with alignment trailing spacing of zero this time is a large weather icon will show so image the variable is going to be forecast dot icon and we'll add the suffix large at the end we're going to add a padding at the trailing end of four. We'll also push the left and the right stacks to the end corner with the spacer between them. Spacer. The final element to blend in is the weather text here. So under the large icon, text, forecast dot weather, we're going to retrieve the weather's a raw value for its string version. Then change its font to footnote and padding trailing of 24. Let's fix the padding on the content now. The padding is going to apply on the H stack. So here. Padding, bottom, 20, and padding, leading, also 20. We'll also set the foreground color to white before the paddings. Foreground color, white. Hey, we're done with this component. Now let's add the weather widgets in weather view, right under the background color. Chances are the widgets take more space than the height of the screen. 
so we'll allow scrolling them. Scroll view. We're going to turn off the drag indicator, which shows indicator set to false. Then wrap a VStack to contain all the widgets with a spacing of 20. After that, loop the components with for each. Forecast.cities. Forecast in. We're going to call the weather widget and pass in the forecast data. Very well. Let me reduce the canvas. After adding the scrollable widgets, we can notice an issue. The widgets are placed initially right under the custom nav bar. Indeed, SwiftUI doesn't know it's a nav bar. We should position the content outside of that zone from the start. There is a modifier for this purpose, safe area inset, that will let us insert a content above or below the modified view. We'll add that modifier to the scroll view, safe area inset. In our case, it's the top edge to mimic the nav bar. Then we're going to put an empty view with a frame height of 110. Alternatively, you could use color.clear instead of empty view. Okay, let's try to scroll the widgets. Good. Afterwards, we're going to implement the final piece of our app, that is the search bar. In modern applications, there are tons of data. So a search bar is imperative for finding the content you need. Today, we tend to just go straight to searching and skip scrolling the content, whether it's by laziness or by being efficient. In this section, we'll learn how to insert the search bar right inside the navigation bar using the native method as well as the custom one. As a bonus, we'll make it complete by managing the search functionality. As a matter of fact, presenting the built-in search bar in SwiftUI is super easy. It only requires a couple lines of code. To any view that is wrapped inside a navigation view, you just have to add the modifier searchable and pass in the search and the optional prompt text. For it to work here, we'll need to embed the preview in navigation view. So command click on weather view, embed, navigation, view. And here, searchable. The searching text is of type binding, so we'll need to declare a state property for it. Scroll to the top, add state, private var search text and default it to an empty string. Then we can pass that variable in the searchable modifier dollar sign search text. Resume. Let's check it out. By default, we need to track down the content a little bit for the search bar to appear. But in this case, we can't see anything because we had set the navigation bar hidden to true. So let's comment that out as well as the navigation bar. Let's try it out again. There you go. That's all. Not only the UI is done for you, but the value in the text field is also taken care of. And the animation too, that's really nice, no? Additionally, you can edit its placement to be automatic, like this, in the sidebar or toolbar, or even inside the navigation bar as a drawer. Let's do that. Add a placement argument to the searchable modifier. Then 
set it to navigation bar drawer with display mode always. And now you don't even have to drag down for it to appear. It's always going to be there. Let's change the placeholder text to something else with the prompt argument. Search for a city or airport. Beautiful. However, our design has its own custom search bar. So let's comment this out and put back the navigation bar and navigation bar hidden. Let's get on to assemble the custom search bar in the navigation bar. Navigate to more button. For the second row of the nav bar, we're going to make an H stack here. H stack with the spacing of two. You zoom. Inside it, put in the magnifying glass SF symbol icon. Image, system name, magnifying glass. After that, insert a text field. Select the one with title and text. This is reserved for the placeholder text. It's the same one. Search for a city or airport. Accordingly, we require a binding property to be bound to the text field. So at the top, let's add a binding var search text of type string. Then use it in the text field. Dollar search text. Resume. The preview is going to ask to pass a value for the search text. Fix. Set it to constant empty string. Resume. We'll also need to pass that from the weather view. Click on fix. Search text. This is from the state here. Resume. Try again. Et voila. Let's make this bigger and go back to navigation bar. Afterwards, we're going to style it by setting a foreground color of secondary. Padding horizontal of six, padding vertical of seven, and set the frame height of thirty six with alignment leading, although the leading alignment doesn't change anything here. Finally, set the background color of color.bottom sheet background. And we're going to round the corners. So in rounded rectangle with corner radius 10. Lastly, apply an inner shadow using our custom modifier. Inner shadow. The shape is rounded rectangle with corner radius 10. The color is black with opacity 0 0.25. Line width 2, offset x 0, offset y 2, blur 2. And we can remove the two other arguments. I just realized that this variable should be in camel case and the same as in weather view. So let's refactor that. Refactor, rename, 
just change the T from lowercase to uppercase, and it's going to give you the other instances where they're being used. So rename. Resume. That's about it. The last thing to do is to implement the search functionality. Close weather widget. In weather view, we'll declare a computed property to return the whole forecast series if the search text is empty or filtered by the text if not. So here, var search results of type forecast array if search text is empty return forecast dot cities else return forecast dot cities dot filter enter we will need all of this in short dollar zero dot location dot contains search text basically dollar zero is the return element without having to name it then instead we can use the search results for the data in the for each loop instead of forecast cities search results resume let's try that in the preview run reduce the canvas and type uh, t yes oh toronto and tokyo only are returned that's awesome. Once we finish coding, we should run the app in the simulator just to make sure that everything performs correctly. Click on the play button right here or command R. All right, let's test all the interactions we worked so hard for. The drag gesture, scrolling the detail view, Drag it back down, tapping on the expand button. Nice. Tapping on the control buttons. Good. Scrolling the cards. Navigating to the other screen. Scrolling the widgets up. Search for city. Back to home screen. Everything is absolutely great. You should give it a go on your iOS device also, but I'll skip that. We have gone over a lot of materials during the progress of this course. I hope you found the content I've prepared for you interesting. If you have watched this far, thank you and kudos. Let me know in the comments below what you have learned and don't forget to like and subscribe to support us. Keep on coding guys.